Good morning. Uh, welcome to everyone. This is a hearing on examining abuses of Medicaid eligibility rules. Uh, pursuant to committee rules, I will read the mission statement. We exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know the money Washington takes for them is well spent. Second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. I will uh, now recognize uh, myself for uh, an opening statement and then uh, the gentleman from Illinois, uh, Ranking Member, Mr. Davis. Uh, as this committee's uh, mission statement just made clear, Americans have a right to know the money Washington takes from them is well spent. Americans also have the right to know whether social programs that were designed for a specific purpose have been hijacked wittingly or unwittingly by those who have figured out how to game the system. Today we will examine alleged abuses of Medicaid eligibility rules. As we do, we are guided by the principle that each dollar taken from a private citizen has a real cost and that government needs a compelling rationale for taking that dollar. To be clear, this country has a rich history of providing a social safety net for the elderly and the indigent, but some seek to turn the safety net into a hammock or trampoline. Not only is this fiscally irresponsible, it erodes the very little public trust people have left in the institutions of government. Without question, the Medicaid program is on an unsustainable course. Over the past two decades, national Medicaid spending has increased from less than $75 billion per year to over $400 billion per year. At the state level, Medicaid growth has put tremendous pressure on budgets and is crowding out other state priorities such as education and public safety. At the federal level, Medicaid growth has the same effect, plus it is contributing to our national debt at more than, as more than 40 cents of each dollar is borrowed. Medicaid is a means-tested welfare program designed to provide medical care to the poor and disabled, but today's testimony will, will reveal that Medicaid is not being used solely by the indigent. Although Medicaid technically has income and asset tests, these tests are easy to circumvent and abuse. In fact, an entire cottage industry has arisen seeking to educate the wealthy on how to transfer or hide ass assets so taxpayers can pay for their long-term care. In 1982, Congress made it clear all the resources available to an institutionalized individual, including equity in a home which are not needed for the support of a spouse or dependent children, will be used to defray the cost of supporting the individual in the institution. Despite this congressional intent, all the resources available to the institutionalized individual are not being used to defray the taxpayer costs of supporting these individuals. According to the CMS, less than 1 percent of the money spent on nursing home care is recovered. The art of artificially impoverishing oneself to gain Medicaid coverage has spawned a standalone industry. Medicaid planning is pervasive. A Google search which includes quotes around Medicaid planning yields over a half million hits. Popular books are available like the one entitled How to Protect Your Family's Assets from Devastating Nursing Home Cost, colon, Medicaid Secrets. This book includes tips on how to title your home so you don't lose it to the state, how to make transfers to family members that don't disqualify you from Medicaid, how annuities make assets disappear, smart tricks for spending down your assets, what to change in your will to save thousands of dollars if your spouse ever needs nursing home care to avoid the state's reimbursement claim following the nursing home resident's death. Government programs should not have secrets and artificially impoverishing oneself to become eligible for a program that was not designed for you is wrong. In 2006, the New York Post ran an article about Medicaid millionaires in one county in the state. In that year, nine millionaires had taxpayers paying for their Medicaid bills. One man, worth nearly $2 million, had Medicaid pick up over $80,000 in nursing home costs for his wife. One woman, worth $1.6 million, had Medicaid pick up over $200,000 in nursing home costs for her husband. Since half of New York's Medicaid bill is financed by federal taxpayers, taxpayers in my home state of South Carolina are paying for millionaires on Medicaid in New York. About once a decade, Congress revisits the eligibility rules for Medicaid to crack down on their abuse. In the 1993 Omnibus Budget and Reconciliation Act, 
Congress required states to do a state recovery. In 2005 Deficit Reduction Act, Congress closed some loopholes and extended Medicaid's look-back period. Today's testimony will reveal whether previous congressional action in this area has worked. We all know that tough choices are coming and that there will be strong partisan differences about the way forward. Today's hearing offers us an opportunity to explore an area where there should be genuine bipartisan agreement. Medicaid was intended for the poor and the disabled. Millionaires should not be on welfare. If the rules of Medicaid allow individuals with sizable portfolios to qualify for the program and protect the inheritance of their children, then Medicaid needs reforming. And with that, I would recognize the gentleman from Illinois, the ranking member, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and let me thank you for holding this very important hearing. I also want to thank all of the witnesses for being here, and especially I would like to thank uh, Ms. Julie Hamos, who probably just came in this morning on the flight that I usually take when I want to get here by 10 o'clock, and sometimes the traffic is a little difficult and you have a hard time making it. So thank you very much, Julie. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the importance of this hearing, and I am happy to have dialogue on this very critical issue. Since its inception in 1965, I have always said that Medicaid and Medicare were the best things that happened to health care, especially for elderly and low-income people in this country since the Indians discovered cornflakes. I am a firm believer that those individuals who have no other recourse, who have no other way to be cared for, should in fact be cared for by the resources that we make available to them. The Medicaid program funds one of six of all personal health spending in the United States. Additionally, Medicaid spending has increased over $400 billion last year. This number gives us pause. But those of us who continue to view Medicaid solely as a budget challenge are missing the mark. This program involves real people and is about real people and their needs. Policy solutions that focus only on limiting public obligations for long-term care financing do the citizens of our country a great injustice. Realistically, individuals and families bear the majority of caregiving and financial consequences. Families and friends provide upward of 80 percent of long-term care in the United States. I am open to new ideas to facilitate the care of people across all age groups who are needy, and certainly not for those who are simply greedy. But these discussions cannot be filled with flawed assumptions about people's resources. The vast majority of Medicaid's enrollees have limited resources including the 33 million children, the 11 million persons with disabilities, the 17 million non-disabled adults, and the 6 million seniors. In Illinois, more than 2.7 million Illinois seniors, children, and individuals with disabilities rely on Medicaid services and programs. Long-term care is a valued program. It includes medical as well as non-medical care to those who have a chronic illness or disability. Long-term care helps meet health or personal needs. Most long-term care is to assist people with support services, such as activities of daily living like dressing, bathing, and using the bathroom. Long-term care can be provided at home in the community in assisted living or in nursing homes. The dignity and peace of mind given to people who utilize these services is immeasurable. Certainly there are those who attempt to misuse the system, but the vast majority of enrollees are simply those who otherwise would not have the wealth or income for such personal daily care. These bad actors must not cause us to throw up our hands and surrender. I have a term that I often use that says I don't ever want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. 
that I want to throw out all of the waste, abuse, and misuse of the programs that we possibly can. Medicaid must continue to provide coverage based on Federal standards that ensure maximum access for low-income and special needs populations with funding allocations based on the needs of these populations. A meaner Medicaid is not a sufficient solution. Now is not the time to reduce access. Compassion and common sense must prevail. Affordable, accessible, quality health care should not be a partisan or political issue, but a human one. Lastly, I am proud that uh, Ms. Hamos has agreed to join us, and I'm delighted again that she was able to make it. And I agree with you, Mr. Chairman. I agree wholeheartedly that those individuals who are misusing the system, those individuals who are using it as a way to make sure that they can transfer wealth, all of those efforts that are underway to prov provide subterfuge, to provide ways to deny access to individuals who really need the services, I will work with you and other members of this body to exercise, to carve out and get rid of all those in, in individuals and those opportunities. So again, I thank you for the hearing and look forward to the testimony of the witnesses. I thank the gentleman from Illinois. The chair would now recognize the gentleman from Arizona, the vice chairman of the subcommittee, Dr. Gozar. Mr. Chairman, I would like to echo the concerns that you shared about the unsustainable growth in Medicaid spending. This is a significant problem in my state of Arizona. The crippling recession of late has affected my state tragically, reducing the money in the general fund by $2 billion in only a couple short years. The governor and legislature are finding one of the biggest expenses the state has is its Medicaid program. In a time where this program meant for low-income people in need of basic health care is facing deficits, we need to explore critical reforms that will ensure limited Medicaid dollars reach those who need it most. I think we will find today that long-term care eligibility standards in current federal law do not achieve this goal. I also agree with you that this hearing should be bipartisan. We have strong disagreements with the massive Medicaid expansion contained in the President's takeover of health care. But we should be able to find common ground that taxpayer programs should not serve as inheritance protection and that the rules that can be navigated so millionaires can qualify for welfare are in desperate need of reform. According to the law firm Wright Ashire um, in Houston, Texas, even if a client's assets are substantial, the firm will be, in almost every case, be able to successfully achieve a satisfactory plan for the client to preserve assets. An organization in California called the Nursing Home Solutions states that we get middle-class families excellent nursing home care funded by Medi-Cal. This advertising makes Medicaid planning sound like the proverbial free lunch. But while the individual's family benefit from taxpayers supporting the long-term care services received by that individual, there are also clear costs. The obvious cost is to future generations and business owners who will have to pay this bill and who have a result have less capital to invest in the economy. The less obvious cost is that nursing homes and long-term care providers are harmed by more individuals receiving Medicaid's low reimbursement rate. So the policy question is, who should bear the burden of paying the cost of long-term care? It would be convenient to say the other guy, but what happens when the other guy is tapped out? Taxpayers are simply tapped out and our nation is running a $1.6 trillion deficit for the third straight year. Our friends on the other side of the aisle may say that this cost should be socialized. But that solution is misguided for two reasons. The first is that we need to be figuring out ways to reform Medicare and Medicaid, not to expand it. The second is that it runs counter to the obvious principle that individuals spend their own money better than they spend other people's money. Since the private sector does most things better than the government, can the private sector play a role in figuring out a way out of this problem? I respectfully assert that the free market solutions have never been able to take hold in the market for, long, for long-term care because of Medicaid. Since it is so easy to get taxpayers to foot a person's long-term care needs, individuals don't have any incentive to plan for these expenses. 
Don't take my word for it, however. In 2008, Jeff Brown of the University of Illinois and Amy Finkelstein of MIT wrote an article entitled, The Interaction of Public and Private Insurance, Medicaid and a Long-Term Care Insurance Market. This article appeared in the nation's most prestigious peer-reviewed economics journal, the American Economic Review. The findings are that all but with the wealthiest households in the country have virtually no reason to purchase long-term care insurance. This is because a private policy pays for many benefits that simply replace benefits that Medicaid would have paid for. It is important to note that Brown and Finkelstein did not even account for the art of Medicaid planning. They assumed that people actually have to spend down their assets in order to qualify for Medicaid. Therefore, it is unfair to criticize the private long-term care industry, insurance industry for a lack of policies. A private insurer is not competing on a level playing field with Medicaid since Medicaid is so heavily subsidized. The way I see it is, is the, clear, the choice is clear. We can fail to reform these rules. This would, this would continue to allow relatively affluent individuals on welfare to discourage all of us from taking seriously the possibility of needing to take care of long-term care in the future. This failure will doom the whole system as a whole. The alternative is to reform the rules and reduce the loopholes. Real reform should prevent affluent people from qualifying for welfare with, a re, with the effect of preserving the inheritance of their adult children. Real reform would also promote personal responsibility and awaken Americans to the fact that while living longer is a great thing, it comes with the possibility of requiring assistance. Real reform would preserve taxpayer dollars to assist genuinely needy individuals in getting care. And real reform would reduce Medicaid's burden on states' budgets and the federal budget and would decrease the amount of money that Washington borrows from abroad. Mr. Chairman, thank you for calling this hearing, and I eagerly await the testimony of our witnesses to learn more about this issue and steps that can be taken to reform the program. I yield back. I thank the gentleman from Arizona. I uh, would also like to recognize and thank the uh, gentlemen from Missouri and Tennessee, respectively, for their uh, presence and their uh, contributions to this subcommittee. Members may have seven days to submit opening statements and extraneous material for the record. It is now my pleasure to welcome our uh, distinguished panel of witnesses. Uh, I will introduce you at once, and then uh, we will go from my left to right, your right to left, in terms of opening remarks. Uh, Mr. Stephen Moses is the president of the Center for Long-Term Care Reform. Mr. David Dorfman is an attorney with the Law Office of David A. Dorfman. Uh, Ms. Janice uh, Ulau, is that close? Is the assistant administrator of the Medicaid Services Division of the Suffolk County Department of Social Services. And uh, my friend Mr. Davis joins me in uh, introducing and welcoming the Honorable Julie Hamos. Is that close? Is the Director of the Illinois Department of Health Care and Family Services. Uh, pursuant to uh, committee rules, all witnesses uh, will be sworn before they testify, so I would ask you to uh, please rise and lift your uh, right hands. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? May the record reflect all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Mr. Dorfman, we, uh, Mr. Moses, excuse me, we will start with you. The uh, lights, which I hope you can see, mean what they traditionally mean. Green means go. Yellow, unlike in real life, does not mean speed up and see if you can get under it. Uh, got about a minute left, and then. Uh, Red is uh, going to conclude your last comment, if you could. Uh, with that, again, on behalf of all of us, uh, thank you. We're honored to have such a distinguished uh, group of witnesses, Mr. Moses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to speak to you about Medicaid and long-term care financing today. I've worked in this field since 1981, first as a career U.S. government employee with the Health Care Financing Administration, the predecessor of the current CMS, then for the Inspector General of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and since 1989 in the private sector. I am currently president of the Center for Long-Term Care Reform. In each of these roles, I conducted national and state studies of Medicaid and long-term care financing. My remarks today are fully developed and documented in published reports available on our website at centerltc.com. Medicaid is supposed to be a long-term care safety net for people in dire financial need. Instead, it has become the dominant payer for most Americans who require extended care at home or in a nursing home, including the middle class and even the affluent. 
How can this be true if Medicaid is a means-tested public assistance program? That is the key question before you today. Here is the answer. Although everyone says Medicaid eligibility requires low income, that is untrue for people over the age of 65 who need long-term care. Federal rules require most states to deduct medical expenses, including the cost of nursing home care, from applicants' income before determining eligibility. Some states apply income caps, uh, but these are easily evaded by means of special income diversion trusts. Bottom line, income almost never disqualifies anyone for Medicaid long-term care eligibility. But what about assets? It is true that cash or negotiable securities over $2,000 are disqualifying in most states, but it doesn't matter how people spend down to that level as long as they don't give away their assets. Financial advisors frequently tell clients to purchase exempt assets, take a world cruise, throw a big party, all non-disqualifying spend-down methods. Just how many exempt assets can applicants retain and still qualify for Medicaid long-term care benefits? There really is no meaningful limit. Exempt home equity is capped at half a million to three-quarters of a million dollars, which is 13 to 20 times the amount protected in England's socialized health care system. But the following resources are exempt without any limit. One business, including the capital and cash flow, individual retirement accounts or IRAs, one automobile, prepaid burial plans, not only for the Medicaid recipient, but for all immediate family members, term life insurance, which allows recipients to evade the Medicaid uh, estate recovery mandate, and household goods and personal belongings, all without any uh, capped limit. The federal regulations and policies that require these exemptions are documented in our report titled Medi-Cal Long-Term Care Safety Net or Hammock. Medi-Cal is just Medicaid in California, and these problems and issues apply nationwide. Married applicants for Medicaid LTC benefits can retain substantially more income and assets than single people, up to twenty-seven thirty-nine per month of income, and the, uh, half the joint assets of the couple up to $109,500. If the healthy spouse's personal income and assets are below these levels, the Medicaid spouse's income and assets are transferred to bring him or her up to the limit. These spousal impoverishment protections increase annually with inflation. Because of these very generous basic eligibility rules, the vast majority of America's elderly qualify easily for Medicaid when they need long-term care. The conventional wisdom that people must spend down into impoverishment before Medicaid will help is demonstrably untrue. Only the most affluent need to consult Medicaid planners and use special legal techniques such as trusts, transfers, annuities, life estates, life care contracts, and promissory notes to qualify. The other panelists will discuss Medicaid planning. The key point I want to make is that we need to remember that egregious Medicaid planning is only the tip of the iceberg. The bigger problem is that Medicaid's basic eligibility rules allow most people to qualify after they need long-term care and without spending down their, welfare for, their uh, wealth first. To conclude, Easy access to Medicaid has the effect of desensitizing the public to long-term care risk and costs. Medicaid's home equity exemption prevents people from using reverse mortgages to finance home care. With most of their assets protected by Medicaid, few people plan early to save, invest, or insure for long-term care. Well-intentioned public policy has turned into a perverse incentive discouraging responsible long-term care planning. Furthermore, Consuming scarce public welfare resources to indemnify affluent baby boomer heirs of well-to-do seniors hurts the poor instead of helping. It's like friendly fire in the class war. Medicaid could save up to $30 billion per year if, med if people had to consume their home equity before qualifying for public benefits, as is true in England. The program's most expensive, dual-eligible recipients could be reduced by 20 percent. Reverse mortgages to fund long-term care would thrive and generate new b jobs and tax revenue. The private long-term care insurance market would expand, creating even more jobs and revenue. But most importantly, relieving 
The financial pressure on Medicaid in this way would enable the program to survive as a quality safety net for those who are truly in need. My analysis explaining how Medicaid can save $30 billion per year by encouraging financing of long-term care through private financing alternatives is, has been made available to the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moses. Mr. Dorfman. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, council. Thank you so much for having me here this morning. My name is David Dorfman, and for about the last 20 years until January of this year, I practiced Medicaid planning law in Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Queens. I came to elder law out of a family experience. My grandmother and her two sisters all went to Portia Law School the first law school for women in Boston back in the 1930s. So I grew up with elder law around the house when her friends would come over to probate their husband's wills, to transfer deeds to the children, to take care of those family matters that her senior friends had. When I began my practice, Obra 93 had just become the law and I attended bar association meetings, met leaders in the Medicaid legal field, and began teaching other people how the system works. Because while Medicaid is certainly not a secret program, it is so difficult for people to understand how it works, given the massive unfairnesses and confusion in qualifying and benefits. My clients would come to me typically because they had a spouse who had Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, a parent who needed care, and they didn't know what to do. They weren't sure of what their options were. So what we set about doing was educating people as to how the system works and creating an individual tailored plan, much like for health care what was the best thing for that particular individual to do. And it might be trusts or annuities, changing title to the home, investing in pensions or insurance. But I'm going to suggest that the abuse is a myth. That's not really what's happening. That's not what any of my clients wanted. None of them wanted to game the system. They all wanted to know, what should I do? The same way a woman whose husband has had a stroke says to the doctor, what am I supposed to do? They say to the social worker, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to live? Where will I be living? What will happen to the pension, the social security? Who's going to provide the care? Soup kitchens are free and nobody checks five years' worth of bank statements, and millionaires don't go there for lunch. In terms of creating a health care system, we don't need a punishment health care system, periods of ineligibility or penalty periods. We need a system that has a cost-sharing approach that invites people in so they can access necessary care and share in the costs. That's what people want. Not an all-or-nothing approach. We can't mandate abject poverty because that's what people are terrified of. And if that has to be created, no matter what the rules are, people will do whatever they have to do to get the necessary health care for their loved ones, or they'll suffer and die without care. I saw people who were increasingly afraid to get care as Medicaid laws became more onerous. People who qualified for benefits, people who were poor and needed health care, but didn't fill out the application because they didn't have the bank statements. Let's create a system that invites people in who need care, not one that punishes them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dorfman. Uh, Ms. Uh, Ulo. 
Good morning, Chairman Gowdy, Ranking Member Davis, and members of the subcommittee, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today about this important topic. My name is Janice Ulow, and I've been employed by the Suffolk County, New York Department of Social Services for the past 36 years. I currently serve as the Assistant Administrator for the Medicaid program in that county. Approximately 180,000 individuals receive Medicaid in Suffolk County, with 5,300 in receipt of nursing home care. In 2010, the nursing home care cost for those 5,300 individuals was $429.9 million, with a federal share of $213.7 million. As a longtime employee of the local Medicaid office, I have had the opportunity to witness the diversion of applicants' significant resources in order to obtain Medicaid coverage. It is not at all unusual to encounter individuals and couples with resources exceeding a half million dollars, some with over one million. There is no attempt to hide that this money exists. There is no need. There are various legal means to prevent those funds from being used to pay for the applicant's nursing home care. Wealthy applicants for Medicaid's nursing home coverage consider that benefit to be their right, regardless of their ability to pay themselves. There is limited understanding that Medicaid for nursing home care remains a means-tested program, not an entitlement program. This misunderstanding seems to be perpetuated by the elder law and Medicaid estate planning industry. A tool most often used by single clients is the promissory note. Half of the applicant's excess resource is transferred to the children without compensation. This transfer results in a penalty period where Medicaid will not pay for nursing home care, approximately one month for every $10,000 transferred. The other half of the excess resource is also transferred to the children, but in return for a promissory note, which will produce an income stream to cover the cost of care during the penalty period. Our county regularly sees promissory notes in excess of $150,000 with matching uncompensated transfers. For couples, the most common method of preserving resources is spousal refusal. In this case, the spouse in the nursing home transfers all resources beyond those he is allowed to keep to the well spouse living at home, since transfers to a spouse do not incur a penalty period. In New York, the institutionalized spouse may retain $13,800. The spouse living at home can retain up to $109,000. In addition, the home and prepaid burial expenses are exempt. Any amount in excess of these resources is deemed available to meet nursing home costs. However, federal law allows the spouse at home to refuse to support the applying spouse and requires states to then base Medicaid eligibility determination on the income and assets of only the applying spouse. States then have the right to bring support proceedings against the refusing spouse. My county has pursued the refusing spouse in the past. However, in family court, we are only allowed to address the excess income and attach resources for past Medicaid payments. Any future proceedings would need to be addressed in New York's Supreme Court, a process that would take months or years for each case and severely strain our limited local resources. The remedy for these abuses lies in education as well as changes to law. Many seniors believe that Medicare and their supplemental insurance policies will pay for the nursing home care, when in fact these policies will only pay up to 100 days of care and only under certain circumstances. Medicare communication through their annual year handbook and their official website is woefully lacking information in this area. Not surprisingly, wealthy seniors fail to realize the value or need for long-term care insurance. Having a better understanding of the limits of Medicare would enable seniors to make timely and informed decisions regarding their future care needs. In addition, incentives for the purchase and use of long-term care insurance should be provided by the federal government. I also respectfully suggest that the law allowing spousal refusal be adjusted to enforce the current resource limits and allow the spouse at home to petition court for higher resource levels should his or her circumstances call for such an increase instead of requiring the state to address each refusal. Allowing wealthy spouses to ignore their financial responsibility to one another is a policy we cannot afford. In closing, I would hope that the Medicaid program can fulfill its original mission to provide quality health coverage to individuals who are una unable to afford such care or the insurance to pay for this care. However, individuals with, with resources above and beyond the level prescribed by law should not be allowed to fund their children's inheritance while the taxpayers fund their nursing home care. I strongly believe that this is not a partisan issue. I also believe in the merits of the Medicaid program but feel just as deeply that these issues regarding resource diversion need to be addressed. Thank you.
Thank you, Ms. Shulau. Uh, Director Hamos. Thank you. Uh, good morning, members of the subcommittee, Mr. Chairman. I'm Julie Hamos, the Director of the Illinois Department of uh, Health Care and Family Services, which, among our other responsibilities, manages one of the largest Medicaid programs in the nation. Illinois serves 2.7 million clients through Medicaid and SCHIP at an overall program cost of $16.6 .6 billion. So today we are talking about eligibility policies for Medicaid long-term care, and this for us in Illinois is a most propitious time to be talking about this since we are tackling this exact issue. As a new director of HFS last April, I learned that Illinois' previous administration had not yet implemented the Federal DRA that passed in 2006. Accordingly, almost immediately when I came in, we set to work to create rules involving Medicaid eligibility for long-term care, rules that incorporate the DRA but go beyond it to actually deal with the loopholes that you are hearing about today since we have now learned from the experiences of other states. Some of those loopholes are, in fact, spelled out in the, the Council for Long-Term Care report that I read very closely. And I have to be honest in telling you that this is a struggle in Illinois to convince our legislative rulemaking committee to adopt these rules. This is not a Democratic problem nor Republican problem. There seems to be, uh, much to my surprise, a bipartisan acceptance of these so-called Medicaid estate planning practices that allow people to divest their assets in order to qualify for, for uh, Illinois Medicaid nursing homes. And the paper, I think, articulates the problem, which is that there is no stigma attached to this. We agree with you that it is our responsibility to eliminate any abuse in the Medicaid program, and we are working hard right now to move along on some of these reforms. Today, I would like to touch on two other issues that have the potential to drive down Medicaid costs for long-term care. Of our 2.7 million clients, 14 percent are seniors and adults with disabilities, yet these 14 percent of Medicaid clients incur 54 percent of the costs. Many of these same clients are also expensive, dually eligible Medicare clients. We are, while we are fully committed to providing for their care, and, and most of them really are low income and very vulnerable people, uh, the, and they need long term care. But the, our focus is all about service delivery reform. Illinois historically has had an institutional bias building up state-operated institutions and nursing home beds. We currently have an excess of 15,000 empty nursing home beds. So we have overbuilt on that side, and, but we have failed to invest in, in home and community-based services, obviously for, at a much better cost. Uh, we believe that uh, we can achieve Medicaid savings and promote a higher quality of life for seniors and the disabled who prefer to stay in their home by rebalancing our long-term care system to shift from nursing homes and make investments in home and community-based services. In addition, many health care services are fragmented for both Medicaid and Medicare and result in unnecessary and wasteful hospitalizations with a revolving door of admissions and readmissions to acute care hospitals, to psych wards of hospitals, and to freestanding psychiatric hospitals. In order to drive down these costs, Medicaid must, in conjunction with Medicare for those who are duly eligible, provide care coordination for these most complex and expensive clients who have chronic health and behavioral health conditions with the goal of keeping them healthier, stable in the community, and not in hospitals, and in, uh, but in community-based long-term care. So I just want to convey to you that in this period of the Affordable Care Act planning, we are spawning an era of innovation in the health care delivery system. Federal CMS is offering incentives and guidance almost daily to encourage us to focus on health care and, and health outcomes, okay, quality care, I'm sorry, quality care and health outcomes in home and community-based settings that will ultimately result in cost savings for both Medicaid and Medicare. And I urge you to maintain the federal funding for state Medicaid programs and funding for these federal demonstrations, waivers, innovations, and policy initiatives. They present a unique opportunity to truly transform the Medicaid program into more, a more effective and efficient health care system. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Uh, I will uh, recognize myself for uh, five minutes of questions. Uh, Mr. Dorfman, what is the purpose of Medicaid? 
The purpose of Medicaid is to provide health care. Universal health care or just for the indigent? The program has financial qualifications, which I hadn't gotten to those yet. I'm just asking you a general question. Do you think the purpose of Medicaid is to provide universal health care or only for the indigent? Health care for anyone who qualifies for the program. Do you agree with me that there's a difference between actual indigency and legal indigency? Oh, a absolutely. There is an incredible distinction between what is so people can indigent. voluntarily impoverish themselves. Oh, people can voluntarily impoverish themselves and to become eligible for government programs. Absolutely. And you think that that is consistent with the purpose, the underlying purpose and mission behind Medicaid? Oh, it absolutely can be, yes. Well, you seem to take exception to my characterization of people gaming the system. You don't believe that millionaires who voluntarily impoverish themselves so their heirs can inherit money and taxpayers can provide for their Medicare, you don't consider that gaming the system? No, because that's not most of what happens or the way it happens. So there are those aberration cases. Are there, the mil that, are there millionaires who have voluntarily impoverished themselves so their children can have an inheritance and we can pay for their long-term care? That is not the typical experience across 20 years of doing Medicaid planning, although there, there are certainly exceptions. Um, when people come, and I'm obviously not trying to violate any attorney-client privilege, but when people come to um, seek your counsel, how often do they come by themselves and how often do they come with their adult children? They frequently come with adult children. It is almost always with either a spouse or an adult child, unless it's an isolated individual who doesn't have family. And you consider your client to be whom, the individual or the children? The client is always the individual. But the individual is almost always concerned about what's going to happen to their spouse or family members. Um, speaking of spouses, Mr. Moses, uh, what is spousal refusal? Well, that is a practice recognized primarily in New York and Florida, whereby the well spouse, as Ms. Yu Lao explained, uh, simply refuses to contribute under normal Medicaid requirements uh, for the cost of the care of the Medicaid uh, uh, recipient. And under the law, uh, the Medicaid recipient has to have um, assigned his or her right to uh, the 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 wealth, in essence, uh, so that the state can go after the well spouse for what is legally owed, but this rarely happens because it's so complicated to do. So the elder law bar in frequent uh, annual conferences uh, urges the rest of the country to take advantage of what they consider a right under the federal law to simply have the spouse refuse to contribute to the cost of the care. It's very, very expensive in New York and Florida. Uh, frankly, I don't think uh, most of the other states have the impunity uh, to try to pull that off. Before I ask you about key payments, uh, Mr. Dorfman and I disagree a little bit about the purpose of Medicaid. I think it's for the, the indigent. He thinks it's for whomever qualifies. Uh, what do you think? Well, <laughs> There are problems in how Medicaid eligibility is determined so that there are what some people call loopholes, but there are provisions in the law that make it quite easy and feasible for people with substantial wealth to qualify. As I explained in my testimony, the real problem is not just the tip of the iceberg, which is the egregious Medicaid planning, millionaires on to welfare, as Mr. Dorfman was saying. The real problem is that the media an elderly person in terms of income and assets walks right on to Medicaid uh, because of all of the uh, exempt assets, exempt in without limit. Uh, so really it, it's, it's difficult to characterize the, the program as a program for the indigent because over the years through intent of Congress, the program has been expanded. I call it eligibility bracket creep to the point where uh, virtually anyone, if they 
don't plan ahead to prepare to pay their own long-term care can get Medicaid relatively easily, no matter how much money they have. Uh, my time has expired. Uh, the uh, gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think there is generally some consensus that individuals should not gain Medicaid eligibility by inappropriately shielding their wealth. In the studies that I have looked at by GAO as well as Kaiser and some others, it would suggest to me that the numbers of individuals who are able to shield large wealth portfolios is relatively small. Could I ask if your experiences would indicate that that is the way it goes? Uh, are we finding large numbers of individuals who are millionaires or close to or have large sums who are able to get around uh, the requirements and, and are inappropriately receiving Medicaid benefits? Well, Mr. Davis, as I just explained, the egregious Medicaid planning of the millionaires, that is just the tip of the iceberg. What GAO looked at was just one technique of Medicaid planning, uh, transfer of assets. Uh, that is not even the most common form of Medicaid planning. There are annuities, life care contracts, the reverse half a loaf strategy using promissory notes. There are any number of ways to get people uh, qualified. But the transfer of assets technique, minor as it is, was still a billion dollars a year, according to GAO. But as I can't reiterate enough, the real problem is that most people don't have to use fancy legal planning because they are eligible anyway. And this has the effect of having sent the message since 1965 when Medicaid became part of the law to the public that you can ignore the risk of long-term care. You don't have to save uh, invest or insure for the risk. And when the time comes, maybe you die with your boots on and you are home free, sort of. But if you do get one of the chronic illnesses of old age, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, stroke, and you need the expensive care that families who provide 80 percent, as you said in your remark, opening remarks, 80 percent of the care for free, if you have to have the expensive care, then virtually everyone ends up on Medicaid. And the program is can't sustain that weight now. So the secret is to target it, I think, to the people who need it most and that thereby ensure a quality safety net for the truly indigent. Mr. Dorfman. Millionaires don't want Medicaid. Millionaires still have other law planning issues, but not Medicaid planning issues. They want fancy care. They want care that they control. They want to be able to fire the people they don't like and hire the people they do like. Millionaires never come in for Medicaid planning. They do want planning. They do need surrogate decision makers as they suffer the illnesses of aging, but they don't want Medicaid. Uh, we find that about 60 percent of, the, of uh, the people that come in for nursing home care have done some type of Medicaid estate planning. Um, albeit, you know, Suffolk County is a fairly affluent um, uh, county in New York State, but that's what we're seeing. In terms of people that are receiving care in the community, long-term care in the community, we don't see it as often, but we still are seeing it. Because transfers, if you transfer your money out of your uh, control for community long-term care, there's no penalty. So we are seeing that as well, maybe in about 15 percent of the cases. But I myself, I, as soon as I joined AARP, I started receiving invitations in the mail to come to free seminars to talk about Medicaid estate planning. Um. <laughs> yes, uh, Ms. Amos. Um, Congressman Davis, what we are finding in Illinois is that this is more of a middle class family issue. Uh, than millionaires. I, I agree with Mr. Dorfman that the millionaires don't want to live in our Medicaid nursing homes. But I think that what we are seeing is that middle class families, if let's say there's a savings, a, a little pot of money of $100,000, somewhat 
you know, modest for, by some people's standards. Uh, the family doesn't want all of that to go into nursing home care, and it's eaten up almost immediately in nursing home care. That's why in Illinois what we're struggling with with our legislative uh, rulemaking committee is that there seems to be this widespread acceptance of that on behalf of middle class families, and that's who they're all representing. But we are learning from these other states, and we really want, we think there are reasonable ways to impose and tighten the eligibility rules that we need to put in place immediately, while also maintaining a better service delivery system and reducing the costs of long-term care generally. So we're trying to do it at both ends because there are so many costs for low-income people that are, un that are wasteful and unnecessary, and we could do a better job just by revising and reforming our service delivery system. Thank you very much. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I uh, thank the gentleman from Illinois, the gentleman from Arizona, Dr. Gozar. Mr. Dorfman, can you please uh, give me the, um, the typical assets of a client that would, uh, that would qualify for Medicaid that comes to you? A typical client, a typical client that comes to me yep. has a home, Value. Well, a co-op, a condominium, worth approximately half a million dollars. They have approximately $100,000 in retirement savings. They're a married couple, and they have approximately $30,000 in cash assets. Hmm. Wow. And Mr. Elow, would you, would you kind of agree with some of those? Uh, could you confirm those? We're seeing uh, assets much greater than that. Um, we're seeing, you know, people often come, and, and they have they had total resources of uh, over Three hundred over four hundred thousand dollars total. That's beyond uh, their home, uh, beyond prepaid burial expenses, beyond those things that they're al allowed to have. And in New York, we take the federal uh, resource standard. We choose the highest resource standard for the nursing home for the uh, community spouse in a nursing home care situation. They're allowed to keep one hundred nine thousand dollars of the combined resources. And we very often find that it's significantly higher than that. Uh, probably most of the people that that do some kind of Medicaid estate planning could at least pay for three to six months of care on their own, and many could pay for two years or more. Um, coming and staying with you, um, when do you see someone that genuinely needs a Medicaid long-term care? not being and can't afford it. Do you see a, an average person coming like that? How many times do they not uh, or do, do they not qualify or not not get it, I should say? Do you see somebody like that? That should qualify yes. for resources that don't get it? No, we don't. If they qualify, they would re be receiving it. Okay. Um, uh, Ms. Samos, uh, you talked about the rebalancing um, aspect of, of care. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about that and, and, and it kind of like a home care aspect? And what has been your idea that it would kind of give me some balance about why that would reduce um, the, the care and long-term care, the cost? In Illinois, we really do have this institutional bias. And I guess, again, there are some uh, powerful special interests behind maintaining uh, state-operated facilities as well as nursing homes, and that's why we really did overinvest in those over time that we have 15,000 empty nursing home beds right now. We pay three times as much, at least, to maintain someone per month in a nursing home bed than what we are providing with a limited set of services for seniors to stay at home. So if we could increase uh, what we're really working on right now is looking at how we could increase the, pa the package of services to keep people in their home to keep them from having to go into a nursing home, which is obviously a much more expensive form of long-term care. But if we, if we paid for this rebalancing, uh, is, can you actually cite examples that would actually show us that we saved money? Yes, we will be able to. And we are would be able to? Actually, is there something actually right now that you can point to a state that actually shows that we saved money? Because it seems to me like there isn't. Actually, there isn't, is there? Because, because we can't find it. Because what we'll actually do in rebalancing is we, have, we open up the exposure to more expenses for f folks at home, right? That hasn't been our experience yet. We are putting in place a different kind of system and uh, the kind of services people need in their home. Yes, sometimes it's very expensive to keep people in their homes for people who are really chronically ill or have very severe disabilities. 
But if uh, there are people who can maintain themselves in their home and have a higher quality of life uh, at a much reduced cost, and we are going to show not just cost neutrality, but real savings in this arena. But it doesn't exist. Mr. Moses, can you actually answer that question, too? Well, I am not aware of any state that has actually reduced the cost of long-term care due to rebalancing. There are certain countervailing factors to consider, such as that people would rather get their care at home. You make a popular form of service delivery available under Medicaid. It creates a stronger incentive for people to find ways to qualify. Not to say we shouldn't provide home and community-based care. We should, but you need to understand why we have an institutional bias in long-term care. That's because Medicaid made nursing home care free in 1965 and resulted in there being no market for privately financed home and community-based services. That's why that infrastructure isn't out there. It's why we're trying to uh, uh, retrofit a home and community-based system on a nursing home-based system funded by welfare, which never has enough money to provide adequate financing. So it is, I think, um, not a, a very satisfactory solution to expand home community-based care under Medicaid unless and until you get the eligibility hemorrhage that this hearing is about under control. Otherwise, you'll just create more and more incentives for people to rely on Medicaid. The best way to get access to home and community-based care is to be able to pay privately. Then you get red carpet access to the best possible care. It's more about the qualifying than anything. Yes. I uh, thank the gentleman from Arizona. Uh, would now recognize the gentleman from Maryland, the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Ms. Amos. Um, let me, in Maryland, there's, a, there's an organization in my district, the Visiting Nurses Association. You might want to, you know, refer to them. They have a home care. That's what they do. They are one of the few organizations in Maryland who are increasing jobs by leaps and bounds because they're saving people money, allowing people to stay in their homes. Most of these people are seniors. So it does work. I just visited them about two weeks ago. Uh, we just had to be innovative, and I, and I, I think you're going in the right direction. Um, Mr. Uh, Moses, so you would have the government pay less money with regard to Medicaid and then for patients to do what? In other words, what would you what would you have them do? What what I and I go ahead and be brief because I got a lot of questions. Well, yeah, you have scarce public welfare resources available. All I'm suggesting is that you target them to the people who are most in need and create incentives for the affluent and the middle class before they're too old to and too infirm so in other words, to get insurance long term care and prepare to pay privately so that they don't become dual. So you would advocate for them getting insurance? Is that right? Well, there are many ways to prepare. You can save, invest, but insurance is, an, is one way. A home equity is the huge pot of money out there. That With people losing going. their homes in my district big time, uh, value going down, I, I don't, I'm not sure about that one. But I want to go back to something Mr. Davis said uh, when he said that this is a you know, multifaceted problem, but one that we can find a reasonable solution to. And I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for calling this hearing, but I want us to be clear on where we are. Mr. Moses, you were invited by the majority and your bio states that you are the president of something called the Center for Long-Term Care Reform. I guess this m is meant to sound like a think tank. Uh, your bio also states that you have testified before most of America's state legislatures, something that think tanks often do. Is that right? Yes. Okay. But, Mr. Moses, when I asked my staff to learn more about you to try to understand where you were coming from, it seems that your views are really nothing more than the views of the insurance industry highly and disinterested or objective observer. Isn't it true that the Policy Advocacy Center you operate is a for-profit company? Is that right? Is it for-profit? Yes. Uh, isn't it true that when you applied to IRS in 2000 for recognition for tax exemption, your group was told it was better classified as a, quote, business league for the long-term care insurance industry? Is that right? No, the organization was originally uh, certified as a 501c3 charitable nonprofit. I didn't feel I could carry the overhead of that, so I decided to become what I 
call a no profit because I just couldn't carry the overhead of being a non profit. I understand. Isn't it true that your organization stated in June of 2000 in correspondence to the IRS that historically nearly all the Center for Long Term Care Reforms funding has been contributed by funding has been contributed by long term care insurance industry? Is that right? Well, Can you report that? I have a membership organization, so individual members contribute $150 a year in order to get my publication, I understand. and I have corporate members as well. I just want to make sure I understand we understand who is funding you. Was the funding to originate the center paid for by the long-term care insurance industry? Some of the funding for the center. What, when you say some, is that 50 percent, 30 percent, 90 percent? Probably most in the early stages, right. all the first year and less over time. Isn't it true that your organization's principal purpose is to advocate for the purchase of long-term care insurance? Is that right? No, that is not true. Okay. If you can permit me to answer the question fully, I will sure, explain briefly, what Sure, briefly, briefly, because I have a lot of questions, and I want to, and what I may have to do is just get your written response, but I would well, do maybe, maybe I want to be fair to you. Maybe another, uh, another member will allow okay. me to answer your question in such a manner that it uh, conveys okay. the that truth. that sounds good. My roots, are, sir, are in the government service. I was an 18-year U.S. government employee. I discovered that Medicaid, which is intended to be for the poor, was not being so used effectively. And I have become an advocate, first as a federal employee working for the Health Care Financing Administration, then for the Inspector General writing national studies that have led to changes in federal law. When I decided I couldn't get it done within the federal government, I left to be on the outside. But my mandate, my mission is to preserve Medicaid as a safety net for people who need it, then, such as the people in, the, in this room. Then you and I are in agreement on that point. But we absolutely me, but, but are. But on that point, i got to ask you this. It's just consistent with what you said, so that you can have further opportunity to explain. In a fundraising appeal letter, does your organization brag that it may be, quote, long-term care industry's top producer, and isn't it true that in your FY2000 fundraising letter that you assert that the center would open the floodgates of demand uh, for your products? Uh, and in your FY2000 fundraising appeal, you were attempting to raise $1 million. You requested $10,000 from brokers and $20,000 from small carriers. Uh, will you provide this committee with a comprehensive list of donors to your organization? You're talking about 11 years ago. That organization, the Center for Long-Term Care Financing, doesn't exist anymore. That was a 501c3 charitable nonprofit. We are now a no-profit, as I explained, and I do not have to and will not disclose all of my donors. Most of them, about a third, are individuals who just believe in what we're doing and make a contribution annually. There are corporate members, some from the insurance industry, some from the provider Like industry, Charles and David Cook? Care. Pardon me? Charles and David Cook included in that? No. Very well. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, General from Maryland. Uh, General from Tennessee, Dr. Desjardins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to the panel. Uh, Mr. Moses, I, th I think we'll just kind of continue uh, where we left off there because I, I find this really an interesting and important hearing. You know, clearly we're facing federal deficits that are unsustainable. We have health care uh, programs that are in jeopardy, whether it's Medicare or Medicaid. And I think what we're trying to do here today is preserve Medicaid for those that really need it. We had a large group in here that uh, they should have been very interested in this because clearly those are the ones that need it. For the past two decades as a primary care physician, I've uh, struggled with the frustration of getting care for people who really need it, and uh, everybody knows people getting it that don't need it. And so to me this hearing is a should be a very bipartisan thing. Uh, you know, Mr. Dorfman had mentioned the uh, wife who is talking to the doctor uh, of a husband who's just had a stroke and wondering, what do I do? And, and indeed, that's a frightening time. And, you know, clearly 
the government, if the government isn't there, then what indeed does she do? Who does she turn to? Does she turn to family? Does she turn to her resources? Uh, we're hearing all this talk right now that the rich need to pay their fair share. You know, this hearing is about people being responsible for themselves and not relying on the federal government when they can afford to do it. So I, I applaud uh, you and everyone who's here today trying to solve this problem because clearly our government cannot afford to pay long-term care for everybody in this country, and we've got to have a better solution, and, and I think that's why we're here. Um, so, I mean, do you think, uh, I'll just ask, do you think it's better that people have insurance and prepare for long-term care than not? Yeah, here's my problem. My goal is to preserve Medicaid as a safety net for people in need. Unfortunately, people in need don't have money to donate to organizations like mine. Right. The people who do are the ones who might benefit from a change in Medicaid policy that, in, that uh, protects the program for the poor. Where would we go if there weren't a half a million dollar home equity exemption? Well, families would tap their home equity after age 62 through products like reverse mortgages, which enable them to remain in the home and purchase that home and community-based care that we would rather people have. Once home equity becomes something that is at risk in case you have a long-term care problem, once Medicaid stops being free inheritance insurance for the baby boom generation, then the boomers will plan ahead and they will be more likely to buy the insurance that enables them to pay privately, if we could divert only 20 percent of the people who are likely to become the dual eligibles that are only 15 percent of the Medicaid population, but 39 percent of the cost, 70 percent of their costs are long-term care, if we could divert only 20 percent of them from ever becoming dual eligibles, it would save Medicaid $30 billion a year, and, and which so is just, enough, by the way, to cover the doc fix. <laughs> Uh, just, just briefly, um, the way things stand now with proper legal counsel, somebody like even Bill Gates or Warren Buffett could qualify for Medicaid? Well, you could as long as you transferred all your assets five years in advance. So there's means for people like that to do it if, if they wanted to do yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, Ms. Ulo, uh, or is it Ulao? Yeah. Ulao, sorry. Um, how often do you think someone who is genuinely poor, uh, maybe someone who cannot uh, privately finance more than a quarter or so of their long-term care, has assistance qualifying for Medicaid long-term care? I'm sorry. It, um, that wasn't very clear. Uh, how often do you think someone who is genuinely poor, and maybe someone who cannot privately fund more than a quarter or so of their long-term care, has assistance in qualifying? How, how often do they get help qualifying for Medicaid long-term care? If, if they feel, feel it fit under the income and resource standards, they will get it all the time. Okay. Would you say that most of the individuals in nursing homes in Long Island could privately finance at least some of their care? Yes. Okay. Um, how difficult is it to recover assets from a state of an individual who has used Medicaid services? It's very difficult because once, uh, well, especially for spousal refusal, once they've did, done the refusal and separated out the resource, quite often if the spouse in the community does not need care, they then transfer that money out to their children prior to their death. So, you know, we can't, we can't go after the resources if there's still a spouse in the community and quite often they're doing, doing their own Medicaid estate planning. Do you get the sense that people are afraid of uh, the idea of, of estate recovery? Is that something they fear or not really? I don't think they think about it. They don't think about it too much. Uh, just, I have very few seconds left here. Um, uh, yeah, I, I was just thinking about this hearing and, and the idea of getting people on insurance, and I think people are very naive. I do think uh, that a lot of people think Medicare will pay for this. Uh, do you think that this would be an area that public service messaging, if they knew that this was going away and they didn't have this option, uh, public service messaging to help uh, get people to obtain long-term health coverage might be useful? Well, it can't hurt, but the problem is the public doesn't fail to buy long-term care insurance or plan for long-term care because uh, they aren't aware of the problem. All the surveys show that people know that it's a big risk, but they still don't buy. Why? Because they know they ignore can. the risk, avoid the premiums, wait until you get sick, and the government pays. Right. So all the loopholes right now are allowing people to skirt the system, uh, you know, maybe even cheat the system Not a little bit. Or it's loopholes, just the basic eligibility okay. rules let so, most people on. So once again, it, it's a case of our government enabling people to uh, skirt the, the proper channels. Well-intentioned, perverse incentives. Okay. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank the gentleman from Tennessee. We would now recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Clay. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And according to a 2009 report by the nonpartisan Kaiser Commission on Medicaid and the Uninsured, the number one reason that people who shop for but do not buy long-term care insurance is cost. Uh, in 2009, the Kaiser report found that long-term care insurance premiums costs vary significantly depending on the age of the purchaser. For individuals age 60 with no partner, the annual premiums for a typical policy average $2,329. For a couple the same age, premiums for the same policy design average $3,096 combined for the two people. If purchased at age 70, premiums would cost on average $4,515 per year for an individual and 6010 for a married couple. Another Kaiser study published in June of this year found that half of all Medicare beneficiaries had incomes below $21,100 in 2010. Furthermore, many elderly individuals are already spending a significant amount of their income on health expenses. In 06, Kaiser found that one in four Medicare beneficiaries spent 30 percent or more of their income on health expenses, and one in 10 beneficiaries spent more than half of their income on health expenses. Uh, Ms. Hamos, Given that a significant number of Medicare beneficiaries are already spending a large part of their relatively small income on health care expenses, do you think it is realistic to ask your average senior citizen to purchase long-term care insurance, uh, which is cost prohibitive for many? Well, I think you hit the nail on the head. It is cost prohibitive, but I think the key to long-term care insurance is that young people need to buy it. That's when it's affordable. And they need to be thinking ahead to their own futures and their families' futures. And young people, as we all know, don't think that way. That is the big problem. If people wait until they become seniors or even middle age and close to being seniors, I think most people don't start down that road because it is very expensive. Mm. It is my understanding that long-term care insurance premiums have increased significantly above the overall rate of inflation. Isn't it true, Ms. Hamos, that from 1995 to 2005, average age-adjusted premiums have increased 59 percent above the overall rate of inflation for individuals aged 55 to 64 and by 32 percent for those aged 65 to 69. Between 2000 and 2005, the more comprehensive policies, which often included inflation protection, raised premiums on an average of 30 percent. Have you found that in your studies? So this, this is not my expertise at all, but I've read those studies, and I've, I've learned that as well about long-term care insurance. We would all like to encourage more uh, use of long-term care insurance, quite honestly. Well, I think it's, if it's out there, the, the insurance companies tell us there's not a robust market for it. And I think what we're hearing today is that in part because Medicaid uh, policy has uh, impacted that, but I would say that part of the problem is that it is a costly purchase for a lot of low-income and middle-income families, and they don't really think ahead far enough to be able to buy it and hold on to it and maintain it uh, throughout their, their lives. And that's why it is so cost prohibitive and that's why it is, it's, it's increasing because the insurance companies don't see a big market for it. Thank you for that response. And Mr. Moses, I noticed that your fundraising solicitation ends by asserting that our established credibility as an independent third party voice allows us to perform an essential roles that no one else can fill for reasons of perceived bias and self-interest. Do you normally disclose to congressional committees and state legislatures that you testify before about the details of your ties to the long-term care insurance industry? Well, it's public knowledge, and as your researchers have determined uh, and provided you the information, uh, that's out there. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but as I explained earlier, uh, I'm not about selling insurance. I'm about saving Medicaid. And the problem is, as one of the testimonies explained, uh, between two-thirds and 90 percent of the potential market for long-term care insurance is crowded out by the availability of Medicaid. That was in the American uh, Economic uh, Research uh, uh, Journal. And uh, as long as that's the case, as long as the public can ignore the enormous cost of long-term care, no financial product is affordable if you don't think you need it. Yeah, will you provide to the subcommittee the names of your corporate donors? No. Okay. Thank you, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman from Missouri. Given the uh, impressive panel of witnesses that, that we have, with your indulgence, we would like to have a second round of two minutes um, each, if that's uh, amenable to you all. Um, we're so fortunate to have witnesses like yourselves, and uh, but we want to be good stewards of your time. So uh, if you are if you have time, two minutes, uh, my math's not great. That may be eight minutes. Is that right, Mr. Davis? Yeah. All right. You all got eight minutes? Sounds good. Um, Mr. Moses, key payments, um, is that a phrase you're familiar with, and what is it? Yeah, um, it's it, the 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 idea of key payments. the The notion is that if you're doing Medicaid planning and sheltering or divesting hundreds of thousands of dollars, you don't want to end up in one of all those awful Medicaid nursing homes. Well, Medicaid. That's, a, that's exactly why I ask you because there's been two witnesses who have said wealthy people don't want to wind up in one of those gosh right. awful Medicaid places, and and the good news for them is there's a way around that. Isn't Absolutely, there, there is. Tell tell, you, tell you, Mr. You Dorfman in, how he can keep his rich clients from having to stay in one of those horrible Medicaid facilities. Well, this is routinely recommended in the Elder Law Journal articles. Uh, don't worry, Mr. and Mrs. Client, we can get you into a nice place because when we divest the rest of your assets, we'll hold back fifty to $100,000 so that you can pay privately for six months to a year. Now, why does that make a difference? You'll get red carpet access to the best quality care because nursing homes, for example, only get about uh, two-thirds th two from Medicaid, what they would get from a private pay resident. So they will roll out the red carpet to attract people who can pay, who can pay Pay privately. So they may have only a few Medicaid beds and be mostly private pay and Medicare, and they are the really nice nursing homes, and the elder law bar always knows which ones those are. The problem is, while the nicest beds and the best facilities are being filled by people who could have, should have, and would have paid their own way, Medicaid people, the appropriate indigent people, can't get into the nice places, and they end up in the 100 percent Medicaid places that uh, the kind of place that 2020 goes in with these mini cams showing people lying in their own waist with bed sores down to the bone. So, so to summarize it, because I've only got a couple of seconds, to summarize it, uh, just save back enough money to be a private pay patient for uh, three months at a minimum, perhaps up to six months, yeah. then quit paying your private pay. That uh, very nice facility can't kick you out because of your form of payment, and you can just live off your Medicaid. Correct. So Medi there is a way. Uh, contrary to what's been said this morning, uh, wealthy people don't have to wind up in those gosh awful Medicaid facilities. They can be at a super nice place if they just get the right legal counsel, right? Medicaid planner simply flips the switch, the Medicaid plan kicks in, and your a private payer becomes a Medicaid recipient overnight. I would recognize a gentleman from uh, Illinois, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. We noticed a number of individuals here earlier in wheelchairs who are part of the disabilities community. For a number of years now, Senator Harkins and I have been working very hard trying to get something passed called community choice, which would allow these individuals to live at home and still get the nursing care or the medical care that they needed and not have to live in nursing homes to do so. Of course, we have not fared very well <laughs> with that legislation. We have not been able to get it passed. Uh, since we're looking for ways to save money 
from Medicaid. Uh, yeah. What would each one of you quickly think of that? Uh, would that be a way to, to save some of the money that we are currently spending? Because nursing home care, the average cost is about $75,000 a year. So if individuals could live at home and we pay for the medical services, then it seems that we would save a lot of money. You would indeed target Medicaid to the people who really need it, and you will have more than enough resources to provide a full continuum of care from home community-based care, assisted living, and uh, nursing home care, but only when it is needed. That's what Either you have to do. There is a system that we run through the VA, the Community Senior Foster Care Program. It is the kind of program that could be duplicated across the entire Medicaid spectrum. An example of what it might do is take three senior veterans suffering from Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, put all three together in a community setting in someone's home, and pay them for providing care. It costs a fraction of institutional care and is a model that could be replicated across the system to provide community care. Uh, New York has a waiver program, a long-term home health care program, that services uh, clients at home, giving them uh, all the nursing home services that they would normally get in, in, a, in a facility in their home, uh, nutrition, care, therapies, and such. And by virtue of the, the the program itself requires that it be it not cost more than 75 percent of what it would cost in a nursing home setting. So we do try to do that. And I, could I also say that I don't really think that in, I, in my county there are Medicaid um, nursing home facilities. All of our nursing home facilities have about 80 percent Medicaid patients. And That was surprising to hear. I, every state really does have different experiences. I'm, what I wanted to reflect on the chairman's questioning before, in our case in Illinois, there are some nursing homes that actually do figure out ways to kick out people when they get when they when they're done with their resources and they figure out how to transfer them to hospitals and then don't, don't invite them back. So it's risky to start out in the fancy nursing home and not know where your granny is going to be a year later or 10 months later. Um, I would say, again, community-based, we think that home and community-based care is a more cost-effective and, and a quali higher quality of care kind of approach for people who are low-income, disabled, uh, and that is the preponderance of the, the clients that we deal with. And I think exactly what Ms. Ilau, what you Lau, was talking about is what we are finding, too, is that we can set a standard for what nursing home care would cost and go below it and meet that standard and, again, provide a higher quality of care. Mr. Chairman, I have got a couple of questions I would like to submit. Uh, yes, sir, without objection. Individual answers to Mr. Moses and Mr. Uh, yes, sir, uh, Mr. Davis. Uh, Chair, we now recognize the gentleman from Arizona, Dr. Gozar. Mr. Dorfman, do you worry that Medicaid planning exploits taxpayers? No, Medicaid planning is the way to protect the individuals who need the government program set up for their benefit. So it doesn't undermine personal responsibility and contributes to a free, free rider culture? No, not at all. What it is doing is taking an individual in any circumstance and looking at what are the most responsible choices at that moment given the existing government program. And sometimes that means transferring the money to protect a wife who is still living at home when you need a nursing home. Hmm. So, uh, Mr. Moses, uh, do you worry about the exploits to the taxpayer and contributing to a free rider culture in this uh, planning, Medicaid planning? Well, yes. I mean, the research shows that people don't plan for long-term care because Medicaid pays for most of the expensive care later on. So. It is not that the public knows all there is to know about long-term care and plans to go on Medicaid. It is the fact that Medicaid has always paid for most expensive long-term care that has kind of desensitized the public to the risk. That is why all the survey studies show that people are aware kind of that they should have a plan for long-term care, but they think Medicare covers it, which doesn't but Medicaid does. And that is the simple 
uh, basic fact that if you could change that, we could preserve Medicaid as a safety net for people in need. And if you had to spend some of your own resources before you got help from the government, as you do in England, England only protects $38,000 worth of all assets, including home equity. If you had that in place, then you would have a demand for uh, planning and saving and investing and insuring. Mrs. Ela, how would you feel about that? Yeah, you know, I, I think I agree that we don't that people don't know enough uh, before they get to that point in their lives about what is going to what's going to pay for their care, and so I really think that there needs to be a lot more education out there. I see commercials every day for for Medicaid estate planning on TV in in print. Like I said, I received free seminar invitations myself, um, just as you know, as just a you know an AARP. Problem member in, in the community, um, and I think there needs to be more education. The other for the other thing, like to really teach people who is paying for it. And I think once people find out that the taxpayer is funding wealthy recipients of care, that there's going to be, you know, s some changes. I just want to say one thing. I, I've heard some things here today, and and you know, I was raised from immigrant grandparents, and the American dream was about personal accountability, personal responsibility. When did we lose honor? When did we lose ethics? And when did we lose the character? What I've heard today just astonishes me. Um, you know, particularly in the other aspect of selling insurance. What is so wrong about selling an insurance plan for somebody to take care of themselves? What is wrong with that? What I'm seeing is I'm from Arizona, and I've seen a group of people who have been on the government dole for the longest period of time fighting to get off it. That's the Native Americans. Something's wrong with government provided health care when it can't look at these aspects. I look at Ms. Hamas, you know, I mean, you know, we had DRAs that we were supposed to follow. We're still not there because it's a bipartisan problem. Um, something is wrong here, and, and we have to look at the whole core. And it started in 65 when we didn't identify those proper rules and, and proper protocols and etiquettes. So I'm apologizing. Thank you. Thank the gentleman from Arizona. Uh, Chair would now recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Clay. Thank you. Chairman Gotti. Uh, Mr. Mr. Moses, um, going back to the point about um, the names of your corporate donors, um, I, just, I just don't find you as a disinterested public policy expert expressing a personal opinion, uh, but in fact a paid long-term care industry advocate. Uh, and in the interest of full disclosure, uh, why wouldn't you want to uh, provide the names of your corporate donors to this subcommittee? It's not required, and I choose not to do it. The point is that that kind of an argument, uh, Congressman Clay, is uh, a logical fallacy. It's called the ad hominem. Uh, to attack somebody based on aspects other than the quality of their work. I would encourage you to read the many reports that are on our website and make a judgment based on right. facts and, and not uh, well, personal know, uh, attacks. Mr. Moses, I, uh, before I came here, I was a state legislator for 17 years, and I, I see the trends of what's going on in the states, uh, that they are uh, quickly uh, shirking their responsibility to take care of the disabled, to take care of the people uh, that are older because uh, first of all, they don't want to raise the necessary revenues uh, to pay their share of Medicaid, uh, and 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 they, um, uh, you know, they um, are, are putting less and less in annually uh, to pay for those people that help build those states and build this country, especially our seniors. Uh, who happen to uh, be in a long-term care facility. So, I mean, um, you know, you don't want to provide the subcommittee with full disclosure. No. And, uh, and for whatever reason. I've spent 30 years of my career trying to find ways to save Medicaid for people in need. The only tools I have are private sector 
industries that stand to gain from a system that would save Medicaid for people in need. Because if we save Medicaid for people in need, others, the more affluent people, will need to spend their money instead of hiring attorneys. They'll need to use their home equity through things like reverse mortgages so that they can get quality care in the private market. And once their home equity is at risk, they will see the need to buy the insurance. And we will take some of the burden off the public programs that are currently unable to provide guaranteed access to quality care across the whole spectrum of care for people truly in need. And we will increase the jobs in the private sector and the tax revenue that enable Congress to do worthwhile things. Right now, we're operating a system that does not achieve its original intent. Well, I thank you for your response. I thank the gentleman from uh, Missouri. And on behalf of all of us, we want to thank uh, each of our panelists. It's uh, been I think informative for all of us, and we appreciate your expertise, your professionalism, uh, and how you interact with one another, and uh, especially in how you have uh, interacted with the questioner. So with that, the committee is adjourned, and we thank you again. Thank you.